p.m. and we are going to get started. So welcome to the ASQ Innovation Technical Community session tonight with Dr. Nicole Radzwill, our October 2022 speaker extraordinaire. Dr. Radzwill is a phenomenal executive leader with a deep technology background as well as her capabilities with growing and accelerating results. She has a background in scaling companies from 10 million to 100 million and has a depth of knowledge in technologies that you would not believe. An innovator, a strategist, an architect, a data scientist, and an advisor to over 20 C-suite executives. She has a phenomenal pedigree in speaking at keynotes, academic conferences, and professional conferences. She is the author of multiple books and articles, and she invites you to follow her at on LinkedIn at Nicole Radzwill. Without further ado, we are going to give you our fun fact for Dr. Radzwill, and that is really that she is an active tornado chaser for over seven years. So please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Radzwill, who is going to kick off our topic tonight, Digital Quality Leadership, A New Look at Change. I will now pass the ball to Nicole. All right. And please feel free to elaborate on your illustrious and phenomenal background because folks, you are in for a treat. A, a business executive, a technologist extraordinaire and our own change and quality and innovation champion. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Radzwill and all of our attendees. All right, so tonight we're gonna to talk about being good stewards of quality because technology is becoming more sophisticated, systems are getting more complex. Uh, you know, we, it, there's probably something related to, to one of those two things, either the sophistication or the complexity that's drawn you here today. And, you know, I was thinking a lot this morning about what it means to be a good steward of quality, like especially right now, right, in the, in the 2020s. I had a, a meeting with a project team. They called me in, um, so that they could do a briefing, so that I could get a review of what they were doing and what they were planning, and give give them the ability to, you know, make some adjustments, do some steering to to get them to generate even more value for their client. And it, you know, it was a it was a little frustrating. Um, there were probably ten people on the call, and immediately, right out of the gate, they started getting stuck. In the technical details, I started hearing about, you know, what this database is doing and, and this enterprise system and uh, these characteristics of the S3 buckets. And it didn't take long for the group to start talking in circles. And so I, I had to stop them after a while and I said, go back to the drawing board, step back, take a look at this from a, a little more distance and see if you can explain what this project is about and how you're going to pursue the solution and what wonderful cool things are going to come out at the end and who's going to use those things who's going to touch them who's going to you know generate their own value with these wonderful things that you produce so explain it to a 10 year old so i had to, to send them back to the the drawing board there and you know it made me think getting people to realize that basic storytelling is important is actually kind of hard. So that's going to be one of the things that, that we talk about over the next 45 to 50 minutes. I'm going to share with you um, some of what I've been learning as I, I've been digging into how we need to adapt as leaders to this next generation of quality. And uh, what you'll hear is only the starting point. So if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper, uh, there's going to be books, reference materials coming out in 2023. So like Rhonda said, if you're interested uh, in following any of those things, uh, just follow me on LinkedIn or make a connection request and I'll, I'll be sure that you get the updates there. So most of what I've been doing for the past few years relates to 
industrial data management. Uh, a few years ago, in 2018, I left academia. I was a professor for about 10 years, uh, teaching undergrad and graduate students. Uh, and I got back into industry. I wanted to help organizations connect the dots between their quality management and their technology strategy. And so every week, uh, I talk to at least one, sometimes more, uh, of people in roles like chief data officers or chief analytics officers or, or VPs of engineering, roles like that, people who really care about how do they make collecting and preparing and understanding and, and using data in their organizations, how do they make that better and more efficient and more effective? So everything you'll hear about tonight is not just the result of research, but also work that we've done with companies of all sizes. Um, we've worked with late stage startups. We've worked with you know giant corporate behemoths. And so uh, that's what we'll share today. And I hope by doing that, that you'll be able to apply some of the, this thinking and, and take a more mindful approach to tackling technology intensive improvement projects. Uh, and you know, to do this, I've always found out that the, the best way to launch into it is to talk about how companies aren't doing things well, because it's always more fun to hear about other people failing so that you don't actually fail yourself. So this information shouldn't surprise you. The, the vast majority of digital transformation initiatives fail. Um, back in 2016, I started working on a book about quality 4.0. Uh, if you haven't read it already, there's a link that I, I can share with you at the end. But what I wanted to know was why is there so much failure, right? Like, I mean, I know that technology is new, but, you know, why is there so much failure? And, you know, for starters, especially in the beginning, um, a lot of leaders who were, who were championing these initiatives decided they just needed to check a box. That I'm getting money for this. Let's do it. Digital transformation. But they really weren't sure why. They, they just knew if they didn't, someone else would. And, you know, losing competitive advantage was, was bad, right? Uh, so when I study a few hundred of, of those cases, I found that one thing consistently could make or break a digital transformation initiative, and that was, is this initiative focused on a specific quality or performance goal? Like, did they have their story straight about what is it we're aiming for? Like, like really, like specifically, like can we envision this world that we're trying to move into? And in those cases where, where uh, the executives and the senior managers did put together that story, uh, there was usually success. And the reason for these disappointing results also won't be surprising. Most transformations are just change management on a really, really large scale. And for change to happen, people need to change. Um, for people to change, you know, you can't just re-educate them or retrain them. You have to guide them. You have to help them change habits. No, no amount of logic or coursework is going to do things like, uh, you know, for example, make you eat healthier. And it's the same situation at work. So changing habits and perceptions is something that everyone needs to keep doing all the time. Otherwise, we'll miss opportunities. Uh, it doesn't matter how long you've been in your career, you can miss opportunities too. And here's an example of how this happened to me just this summer. Um, at the beginning of July, I was in Monaco, right before Monaco Art Week. Um, the picture that you see on your screen is actually not a stock photo. This is a, a picture that I took at lunch one day. Uh, and so this is looking down on uh, the city of Monaco and then, and then France surrounding it. And so while I was there, uh, you know, because I like to connect with um, friends of friends in my professional network, while I was there, I connected with a guy named Alan. Um, Alan is the CEO of a company called Metaverse. And uh, he was telling me about this company and, and why they were in Monaco for that week. They were digitizing, and I say digitizing, but, but really they were, they were 3D digitizing and metaversizing an art collection held by Prince Albert of Monaco. So what he was telling me is, you know, imagine that you go to the, the third floor of a, an old warehouse and it's 10,000 square feet and packed tight like sardines everywhere in this warehouse are old pieces of very, very fine art. 
that no one is benefiting from. You know, nobody can see it. They're not being curated. And so what he was helping um, uh, Prince Albert's organization do, uh, preserving art, what he was helping them do was taking a sample of the artworks and recreating them in the metaverse. And so um, what he said was, you know, if we can if we can show people that you can actually experience this art without having to do, you know, the the resource heavy, the resource intensive activities of of curating and protecting these things, you're gonna enable a whole lot more people to experience the art. You know, it's not going to be sitting in that in that old warehouse. So while we were talking, while we were out having a beer, um, I was pressing him on trying to figure out what quality assurance might look like as people are building out the metaverse. Uh, and, you know, he kept saying over and over, we don't need QA people. We tried that. And so, you know, you can imagine, yeah, it kind of hit me in the gut. Um, so I kept asking, right? And our conversation went around and around and, until he said, the value that we provide is in showing people what's possible. We don't need to mass produce anything. We don't need things to work perfectly, but we do need things to work just enough to help people start imagining how they can build the future. And, you know, that really impacted me because quality and excellence is context dependent. He was very, very clear about that. And in his context, it means discovering the things that will inspire other people. Uh, it, it, to him, it was the quality of the story that matters. And so, you know, that really opened me up to, to think more expansively about the applications of quality as we, we move into uh, deeper realms of, of applying uh, emergent technologies. Context is important, and I, I knew this before meeting with Alan, but it really underscored a new way of thinking about quality. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures that sends the same message that uh, context is important. Uh, but that's a really simple case. Uh, so let's take a look at a really big, messy case that impacted a whole bunch of people around the world. Yeah. So uh, here we go. We're in March 2016, March 21st, 2016. On this day, I don't know if you remember what you were doing, but tens of thousands of people had a really bad day. And actually, it was going to be a really bad week, too, but they didn't know that yet. And you might have been one of these people, so you may even recognize the story, um, although it's more likely that, that you've forgotten by now. So here's the scenario. Um, you're at your computer, and you go to pull up your company's dashboard or uh, some other software interface because you want to see what orders have come in. You want to see which orders do I have to fulfill today. And so you pull up your dashboard, and you don't see, no orders came in at all. And you're like, that's kind of weird. And then you see something else that's also kind of weird. So you close your browser because that's how you're using this software, using this dashboard. And then you open it back up again because that's what you do, right? Shut it off, turn it back on. And the problem is, is still there. And, and so you decide to reboot your machine and the problem is still there. And then you go on to Teams or Slack or whatever whatever you use to communicate with people at your office. And you notice that people are chattering, right? Everybody is seeing the same thing. There's no orders. So nobody can fulfill any orders because there are no orders. You're pretty sure that's not realistic because you get hundreds of orders every day. And what happens is your business is at a standstill. So fortunately, this was on a Monday. Because even if your company had IT people ready to, to spring into action, uh, they were about to head out on a detective mission because instead of your dashboards, instead of your, your forms to enter new data, this is what they saw when they opened things up. There's just 11 lines of code driving this error. So uh, 11 lines of code, big problem, impact is, is huge because these 11 lines of code just happen to be imported and used by hundreds, maybe thousands of open source software packages around the world, including one called React, which is the web framework that at the time was the number one framework businesses chose for their high traffic websites, like Facebook. So all of those small businesses using Facebook as your, your ordering platform to, to drive your business, and everybody who relied on that programming engine, the same one that's, that's 
driving the businesses, the business functionality on Facebook, everybody had damage control to do. So it wasn't a very good week. Um, you might wonder why did this happen? Um, turns out there was a young guy, uh, he was living in Berlin at the time, Turkish guy named Azer Kocalu. He was a software engineer. He worked on a whole bunch of open source projects, including a project that he called Kik, K-I-K. And his Kik package that had a whole bunch of really useful utilities and it was so useful. This guy was such a, a you know helpfully useful programmer to the whole world um, that his package was downloaded more than 20,000 times a day by other programmers. Well, on March 21st, 2016, he decided he wasn't gonna let the rest of the world use his package anymore. And it wasn't like he just woke up one morning and was like, yeah, I'm not doing this. He, he was actually responding to a legal skirmish uh, that had started with a company and the, the company he was bringing the lawsuit against him had a product named Kik. So Coach Alou's package was Kik. This company had a product named Kik. Turns out the company owned the trademark, but the trademark had been filed a lot longer after Coach Alou's package was in place. So, you know, his package was in place and used by tens of thousands of people. And this company comes, they build this product that has the, the same name. And, you know, Coach Alou was like, um, this should be mine. I, I, I had my package for a whole bunch of years longer than you've had your company with your product. And so he said, okay, company, uh, I can give up my package name for $30,000. If you give me $30,000, you know, I, I'm going to have to invest my time in changing all the naming. And it's probably going to take me a couple weeks. So if you give me $30,000, then no problem. I'll make the change, you can have the package name. And that's a pretty good deal because uh, changing package names, I mean, it can be really time consuming. So uh, Coach Lou wasn't happy about this request, but he did agree to go through with the name change if the company would pay him for his time. So, you know, it seems reasonable. But they said, nope, sorry, not gonna do that. So how'd the company respond? They complained to the, the package registrar. Um, the, the name is NPM. It's the company that keeps track of, of JavaScript packages that lots of people share between companies. Um, and what, what happened then? Uh, they just handed ownership over to the company with the product. So the package manager, you know, they didn't know any better, um, turned out to be a, a pretty ill-advised decision um, because Kochalu, who had 273 packages registered to NPM, was just like, I'm getting out of here. You know, you overstepped your ethical boundaries uh, with, you know, you, your relationship with software engineers everywhere is just broken, in my opinion. Um, so in protest, he just removed everything, all 273 things that uh, he was maintaining, basically, on behalf of the world, which is when the tower began to crumble. So uh, chaos started to spread. Business people were totally unaware of this. They were just trying to keep their businesses operating and get their orders back in. Um, eventually what happened is NPM put a lock on their systems to prevent uh, this kind of cascading failure from happening. But uh, you know the, the damage had obviously already been done. It took, uh, took months for businesses to recover after the, this event in March of 2016. And now it's six years later. Our businesses are, are even more interconnected, or our software systems are even more interconnected. Uh, Fifteen years ago, companies were just starting to be open to software use, and today it's like, you know, who doesn't reuse software? Who, who doesn't use uh, open source things to, to get your stuff done faster? Um, it, so it's easier and faster to grow your business, but it's also riskier, and to a large extent, that risk is pretty much invisible, especially if you're on the business side. Uh, but, you know, it's even somewhat invisible if you're on the software side and you know that comes out in interesting ways too like for example um this guy is moxie marlin spike um you might be like that's a strange name well his real name is matthew rosenfeld he's a um, cryptographer so a mathematician he founded the company signal which you might use for your secure texting and he was on the forbes 40 under 40 he's, he's a really smart guy and not too long ago, he decided he was going to do a stress test of NFTs, which you may have heard of. NFT stands for non-fungible tokens. The idea itself 
is pretty compelling. So kind of like you have this, this digital object and this digital object affirms that you have ownership of something. So you can think like, for example, when you buy houses or when you buy properties and you have to, to go through the process of, of the title search, basically they're just trying to figure out who owned your house throughout history and do they owe money on it? We want to catch it before you buy the house. Well, what if you could just buy the NFT that was associated with the house? And that NFT had inside of it all of the provenance, all of the revision history of your house. Um, you know, kind of like uh, like when you go and, and get car information on Carfax and you can see, you know, what your odometer settings were at different times and all kinds of accidents your car got into or, or hopefully not. You know, what if we could do that as a, a, a just a matter of habit for all kinds of different things? But Moxie, in looking at this whole NFT marketplace, um, and, you know, you may have heard in the news uh, where people were doing things like buying um, these really strange pixelated pictures of apes for like two, three million dollars, maybe even more. It was, it was kind of ridiculous. Anyway, Moxie, this really smart guy, says, you know, something's wrong with this whole process. I, I want to figure out what it is. So he minted some NFTs to sell, which is basically like create this digital asset, and he wants to see if someone will pay him for this digital asset. And usually when people do this, they're, they're selling like, I mean, essentially like JPEG images. So he minted his NFTs, and he posted first on the OpenSea marketplace. This is one of the, like, it's like Amazon for NFTs. And he did a couple revisions to the digital image that he wanted to sell. I mean, he's not an artist, so he just kind of threw something together, but he wanted to try out NFTs, um, which meant he had to remint. So he did version one, um, he minted it, and then he's like, eh, I think I'd like this to be a little bit different. So he minted it again, and then he reposted it. And he wanted to, you know, make it as easy for his prospective buyers to buy his NFTs. So he posted on multiple marketplaces. And then, surprise, um, probably because it was him that produced them, people bought his NFTs. But this is a, a really great story of um, caveat, emptor, buyer beware. Because it turns out that when you buy an NFT, you're not actually buying a digital asset. You're buying a link. So when you use a URL to go to a web page anywhere, you're buying whatever is at the end point of that URL, right? And you don't have control over it. So whatever's at the end point is technically yours, but if the server disappears that it's sitting on, uh, it, it, there's nothing to just stop your digital asset from, from existing. Um, there's also nothing stopping a person from swapping out the brilliant digital art you just purchased, your, you know, fancy ape or whatever, and replacing it with, uh, you know, whatever there on the right. Um, and <laughs> that's what he did. He, he sold the NFTs, which are essentially just links to a location, and then he said, I'm going to change what's at that location and see if anybody notices. So you can imagine when people opened their wallets and they saw the emoji on the right, they noticed something was wrong. They tried to get their money back, but the uh, the marketplaces were like, no, this is this is how NFTs work, actually. And, you know, there was a lot of buzz around this topic earlier this year. You might have wondered at the time, if you heard uh, all this going on in the news, like, what are people actually buying? And I think the the allure of NFTs is that people are buying membership into a club. They're they're buying a, a spot as part of an alliance of people who also believe in the the power and potential of this new technology. They're kind of like groupies for this new technology. I mean, even when the technology for digital ownership, which is really what we're trying to get at, can be pretty easily proven to not adhere to even the most basic quality standards. Like, you know, if I buy this digital asset, it's actually what I think it is. So, you know, sometimes getting people to see that the, the diamonds, this new fancy NFT technology in front of them is actually uh, the opposite of diamonds, it, sometimes getting people to see things like that can be hard. Um, here, here's another story. Yeah, here's another story. So just a few months ago, this is uh, April of 2022, an article came out on Vice, and they had a pretty stark assessment. They said Facebook, um, 
that you know most of you have likely not only heard about but used this company that's been clear, collecting terabytes of personal data on you and your friends and your family members for almost 20 years has no idea how any of its data is being used. So th this is a really serious accusation for a lot of different reasons. Um, first, they're kind of required to know how they use your data uh, by law. Um, GDPR, which is the European Union's general data protection regulation. Um, it's, it, this, that law took, took effect back in May of, of 2018. It regulates consent to access your information, even if the information is as small as um, your preferences for, for color, or you know, do you like dark mode when you log into a website? And that's why we now see so many prompts on websites asking you to accept all cookies. Like if you if you have traveled to Europe anytime recently, you may remember surfing the web is kind of hard because you got to click accept all cookies a lot. But it, you know, it's by law. The companies are required to capture your consent in addition to your data. Uh, GDPR also protects your right to know when your data is being exchanged with another company. Uh, and more interestingly, it protects your right to be forgotten. So if you're like, I'm going totally off the grid, you need to remove all trace of me from your databases, the companies in Europe are, are obligated to um, comply. And violations can come with big fines, like up to 20 million, uh, I can't remember whether it's dollars or, or euros, but uh, in the past four or five years, uh, over a thousand companies have been fined. Um, Amazon's been fined. Google's been fined. Uh, the clothing firm H and M they had to pay a, a 35 million pound fine. Um, their fine was for this is a good one for improperly storing recordings of meetings where employees were talking about stuff that happened in their personal lives. So they recorded Zoom meetings, didn't get the employees' consent to disclose the personal information, and they got fined from GDPR. So, you know, the lesson there was don't store or process data without knowing how you plan to use it. And you might already be thinking, but don't most companies store data without having a plan for how to use it? And the answer is yes, and that is indeed a part of the problem. Because GDPR isn't the only regulation. Um, there's also the California Consumer Privacy Act, that's the CCPA. It has similar aims for, you know, protecting the, the residents of California. Facebook even makes claims uh, like, and, and this is even mentioned in the Vice article, we will not use X data for Y purpose. And you know, it's real easy to write policies that say what you're going to do, but you know, as you might have discovered in, in your own experience, it can, it can be not easy at all to follow through consistently on those policies. So this is you know, certainly a, a case of that. So it turns out that the material in the Vice article wasn't just accusations about Facebook. They they actually uh, wrote the article um, from a leaked internal document. So I think it was like 419 pages worth of you know emails and um, meeting minutes, things from inside Facebook. Uh, and the document, one of the documents said, or, or no, this was uh, this was the Vice article. The Vice article said even Facebook's own engineers admit but they're struggling to make sense and keep track of where user data goes once it's inside Facebook's systems. The problem inside Facebook is known as data lineage. And this is a problem a lot of companies have because data lineage is essentially traceability. Um, the bottom line is for the past two decades, you know, companies focus on data as a fixed asset. We've forgotten to center our strategies around how value from the data is generated. Um, it's just, you know, what are those data flows? What are those streams? Um, it, we're forgetting to orient the streams around how um, data is turned into actual insights that people use. So why is this lineage stuff so hard? Um, one reason is there's there's really a, a fractured and fragmented um, product centric market for data management. It's it's really easy to buy one of the you know million dollar products that's just come on the market. Uh, I think in just the past year there have been 200, 300 new entrants. Um, the, those those diagrams you might have seen them. The, the, they're like pictures that have logos all over them that show you all the products in a space. If you look at the one for data management for 2022, 
but there's so many of them that the logos are so small you actually can't see them even if you even if you um, blow it up. So really easy to buy these products, right? Um, especially when a lot of money is flowing in, and it, it's really difficult to drive value from those products consistently, especially if you you know try and cobble a whole bunch together. And when you add in that most data engineers, um, most frontline workers in this space spend no more than 24 to 36 months at each company, and that's even a lot. It, institutional memory, just, you know, it really doesn't get a chance to develop. And um, the way most managers respond to this is they throw more people and more money at the problem. Um, it happens in software development. It happens in data management. And, uh, you know, engineers typically don't pick engineering jobs because they like interacting with people a lot. They just want to code. So the more tools you get, the more complexity you introduce, and the more people and interactions you have to deal with to navigate that complexity, which, which makes um, data and information quality assurance, which is a cornerstone of most quality 4.0 work. It makes it a really thorny communication and, and change management landscape. Uh, data management, data quality um, can be really abstract topics. So especially when I'm working with teams, uh, I like to uh, explain things in terms of analogies. And one of the analogies I think about a lot is <laughs> if restaurants managed food service, like most companies manage their data, the restaurants would be in shambles and people would be getting sick or dying all the time. But, but we'll get to that part in a second. Let's, let's talk about the, the value angle first. So you're running a restaurant. The idea, the notion of customer value is always like right in front of you at all times. And there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can design what you do with that value orientation. You can pick recipes that your customers are going to enjoy. You can, you can select ingredients that are going to make your recipes taste great. You can... You can design a production system that gets those recipes onto your customers' plates um, quick enough that their non-functional requirements are met. Um, and what I mean by that is things like food not being cold when it arrives. Um, and why, why do you as a restaurant owner, or why do restaurant owners typically focus on value? I, I mean, you've been at restaurants. That no matter how great your recipes are, no matter how great your raw materials are, or your ingredients, or you know your production system, how you make those recipes. What ultimately matters is customer experience. And so, uh, especially in the digital age, we're competing for online reviews and the stars, the you know five star ratings that are going to end up translating to more word of mouth, more customers, more revenue. There's a direct connection between the quality of the product and the quality of the process, and whether you get those high demand stars and what your average star rating is. Um, because, you know, if people visit a restaurant and even one person gets sick, you know there's going to be some single stars posted and you, you know word is going to travel quickly. And you might notice that I'm conflating safety and quality a little bit, but safety is um, both a dimension of quality for food service and an antecedent for something that needs to be in place before quality can happen. So in my opinion, you can't talk about quality in food service or food production without making safety the centerpiece. So um, we want our food to be safe, obviously. We want our food to taste good. We want to get our food before it gets cold and probably a lot of other non-functional requirements. And so we do all kinds of things to protect us and ensure that all those goals are met. We design a process in our restaurant. Uh, we design and lay out a physical space for that process to work within. We want to make sure the workers have easy access to the materials they need and, and won't get into each other's way or you know, negatively impact safety or other aspects of the environment. We design storage facilities that have quality controls built into them. Um, for example, refrigerators, right? Making sure that foods that need refrigeration are kept cool um, at the right temperatures. We want to make sure that, you know, not just refrigerators, but all other equipment and machines are maintained because that could adversely impact the food or the people using those machines to prepare the food. Because as you might imagine, safety incidents in the, in the kitchen uh, can contaminate food 
they can slow down production or they can even stop the production line. Like you can imagine if something particularly dire happens to a person while they're while they're trying to, to cook, that could that could really impact the entire production line, which is going to translate into customer satisfaction. So we make sure there's hygiene standards. We make sure there there are processes and practices and protocols for maintaining hygiene because we don't want any more contaminants to creep into the product. And we make sure we set up checkpoints along the way. You know, we got checklists, we've got um, measurements, a whole bunch of things that we do. All these things are in place to make sure that uh, our production system works well and that the food quality and the customer sat are as high as they can be. And it's easier to protect the final product and the, the process that creates it um, if we if we can assess work in progress, if we can use those checkpoints. And for, for food service, we care about the flow of materials through at least a few stages. Number one, the raw material stage. Uh, number two, the pre-assembled ingredients. Um, and all the way through the process of executing, carrying out the recipes so that the final products are prepared. And then at the end, we check it. We check the components early and often. Um, we make sure that we know all the steps in the transformation process. You know, everything is pretty much tracked and controlled because we want consistency. We want we want safety. We want uh, to be able to you know deliver something to our customer's plate in a reasonable amount of time so that they won't leave. And why do we do this? So first, you want to make sure that we can figure out every single place a raw material ended up. So for example, let's say you know that there's been an E. coli outbreak, and it's linked to a particular type of spinach. And you know your restaurant bought that spinach. So it should be possible for us to, to really quickly determine every single dish that that bad spinach went into uh, so that we can hopefully alert consumers or at the very least like stop putting it in new dishes in a totally digitally enabled restaurant we would have contact information for whoever ordered the meal and we'd be able to alert them by text if they ate a dish that had that bad spinach in it and there's actually already some restaurants doing this sort of thing right now so you're going to see a lot more of this in the next couple of years but let's imagine that this is a data management process. How easy is it to tell if people get bad information on their, their figurative plates? Uh, those plates could be the reports, the dashboards, the software interfaces that you look at. And if you know you're getting bad information, how easy is it to trace back to the source and find the problem and know that it's actually the problem? I mean, this is data lineage. It turns out this process is not easy at all. And uh, the data lineage products on the market right now, um, which aren't panaceas, they, they drive down to such a detailed technical level that sometimes the story gets lost. Um, that last step, who's impacted and what's important to the people that are impacted, um, that gets left out of the lineage at all. Um, so say also, given a, given a dish where somebody got sick after eating it, um, maybe they submitted complaint. So somebody eats your food, they get sick, and they complain. They leave you a horrible one-star review. And so you know they got sick, and you want to make sure that you don't make other people sick. So you want to be able to trace backwards to figure out which raw material was the culprit. You also want to figure out which process step did things go wrong at. You want to localize the issue so that you can fix the issue and be, make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, and that's how quality management systems for food service maintain high standards for safety and for quality of the final product and, um, the, and, and the process that produces it. You know, a totally reasonable, totally rational collection of, of things. We've got the quality systems, they provide transparency and visibility, and they give us a shared understanding of what we're trying to, to get done together. Um, we make sure we implement nudging. Those are things like update training and, you know, in, in the kitchen context, signs with reminders to wash your hands or checklists. And uh, those things help us make better choices in the moment. We've got to be rational in a restaurant because the stakes are high. The, the health and well-being of real people uh, is at stake. And together, these, what these things help us do is reduce human irrationality that make it easier for us to self-manage and adapt to circumstances when they're, they're changing around us. 
they make it easier for us to respond to new information when it comes in so that we can adjust and we can pivot. We need the quality system, but we also need the continuous, um, the, the continuous injection of emotional energy that keeps people aligned around the quality system. But in data management, uh, unfortunately, today, hopefully this will change in the future, uh, human irrationality is totally what dominates. And I think that's really the key challenge of, of the upcoming decade, because while you can be pretty certain that if you go into a restaurant that's been passing its health department inspections, that you're not going to be the victim of, of foodborne illness or, or poisoning, and you're not going to die, um, you can be similarly certain that, that any organization from, from the small startups to the huge big ones, um, they've got a lot of bad data and bad information floating around. And even though business users in their organization might have vague feelings about what they can trust and can't trust, in general, people just use what they can get their hands on. So not only is there bad data floating around, but, you know, people use what they can get, not what's good. Um, bad data won't make people sick. Bad information in general won't lead to terrible consequences or, or even obvious consequences. Um, it, sometimes it takes some time for those consequences to happen. So I often think to myself, if we manage food service, like we tend to manage our data in our organizations, what would that restaurant look like? And so, you know, there'd be some really unfortunate things going on. Like, for example, you might do some quality checks on all the raw materials stored in the cooler, but like no checks after the food leaves the cooler. So maybe it sits there for an hour, maybe it sits there for five days. Who knows? You didn't check it. Um, if food service was run like data management is in most companies, nobody would have any idea of the end-to-end -end process. So um, if a dish makes somebody sick, the tracing process would take like weeks or months. You still might never be able to get to the root cause by this time. You know, your whole town is dead. Um, the refrigerator, refrigerator would only be ac uh, accessed by one or two people. Like, you know, not everyone can actually get to the refrigerator. Um, and the people, the people with refrigerator access would say, oh yeah, we're totally checking the food, it's fine but there'd be no way to independently verify their claims. Um, also, there'd probably be no records. So you can't independently verify and you can't trace back and <laughs> see if they're telling the truth some other way. Uh, at least some of the ingredients in every recipe would be invisible. They'd be going in there, but nobody would be able to see them for sure. Um, Oh, another good one, the, the raw materials and ingredients you use, they would be buried in other raw materials and ingredients and fin finished products that have been stored just in case. You know, you got, you got a whole bunch of extra raw materials and ingredients and side dishes. They're, we're going to keep them over here just in case, even if they're not relevant to new dishes being prepared, because you never know when we might need them. Right. So the, those are just a couple of ideas. But you get the point, right? Um, decisions that are made in data management tend to be rather irrational, but they can, you know, it can be hard to see. It can be hard to detect until it's too late. And it's easier to work with data now than it ever has been. It's easier to get. It's easier to keep. It's easier to, to navigate and, and play with. But easy doesn't always mean rational or even explainable. So what would be rational when you're managing your data? Um, it's things like articulating the process, making those invisible parts visible. Everyone's got to be able to, to benefit from a shared understanding. Without a shared understanding, um, you're really introducing potential cataclysm. Uh, second thing, realize that a process is a process, right? Um, I have so many people tell me, oh, you know, I, I can't understand this because this is technology. Uh, advice. You shouldn't ignore the process because you're, you know, not a technology person. It's, it's all process-based. Um, it, recognize that if your inputs are bad, your outputs are going to be bad. And, you know, make sure your data chefs have access to raw materials that you've created consistently, um, that you've inspected for quality, and that people don't have to reinvent steps over and over. Um, there's so much irrationality. And, uh, because this is what we see, it's not uncommon to see data quality issues impact customers. But like I said, um, sometimes it just takes a while, right? There's there's no quick and immediate path between the problem with the data quality and, and how it impacts people or business. And, and unfortunately, um, sometimes that can happen in some scary, big ways. 
like this one. So here's one that happened just this past spring. This is from a power company in the UK. Uh, they decided, I mean, this part's really cool. They decided they were going to reimburse people for their power being out during a storm because they didn't restore the power quick enough. So the power was out for quite a while. So they sent checks. But unfortunately, thanks to a data quality problem, um, they sent this person a check for two trillion pounds, which even if you don't know the exchange rate, you can imagine this is not good for the company. Uh, it turns out they sent uh, similarly large checks to a whole bunch of the person's neighbors. Um, and, you know, fortunately, the scale is uh, so large that the bank wouldn't be able to cash them. But, you know, what if this was only for like a couple thousand pounds and they sent it to a few thousand people and everybody cashed in? That could have created a, a, a really terrible problem for solvency. So here, here's an example of a, a data quality problem that did have immediate impact. Um, he, here's another class of data quality issues that has relatively uh, like impact. Um, the, this is about Excel. Um, Excel, it, it continues to be a bless, both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in the sense that um, it's brought reactive programming to the desktop. So a lot of people do reactive programming in a way that they don't feel like they're programming. This has been really, really great for business productivity over the past few decades. It's that, it, data analysis is really accessible thanks to Excel. But in Excel's infinite quest to make things easier for you, um, if it's part of your data flow, you really have to watch for how it introduces errors because it's trying to be helpful. And uh, the problem is sometimes it takes years to figure out how helpful Excel is trying to be, and that leaves a lot of room to accidentally make bad business decisions. So uh, this example here on the screen is names of genes. So names of genes in genetics can be problematic. Um, matter of fact, a few years ago, geneticists got so fed up with Excel's helpfulness that they got together and they changed the names of the genes officially, just so they wouldn't have to deal with uh, things like uh, MON, which is an actual gene uh, term turning into Monday and other things turning into days that are, are, are not days. Um, and dates are a huge issue. Excel loves dates. It loves dates so much. It wants to turn everything into dates um, and data to work with a lot. Um, some people have started developing some superhuman skills uh, where where dates are concerned. Um, read through that panel on the right. Read through that panel on the right for a moment before I click through to the next slide because the uh, the punchline is coming. Starts with 57.39. Definitely not a date. It's all going to convert it into a date. Give you a second to read through that. No, how much does it make me a nerd to say, I'm pretty sure 57.39 would resolve to February 26, 1900 at 9 a.m. And it, it turns out it's actually it's actually close to that. But you know, the, this is how crazy Excel is based if you don't know that uh, in advance, like a lot of actuaries do. They're actually um, date wizards in Excel. It can, it can introduce some really, really unfortunate errors. And th this is only a tiny sample of um, the crazy ways that Excel can help you into oblivion. And we can't just tell people stop using it. It's, it's a huge critical part of translating raw data to value. It makes data analysis accessible to so many, um, especially in the financial industry. So we have to figure out how to make the most critical data streams that Excel supports visible. We have to make sure uh, people who rely on it have access to certified and clean data. So what are the lessons from all these stories? What can what do they tell you about what you can do to be a better leader, um, especially as the, as we're in the age of quality and quality management becoming digital? Two things. The digital systems are often fragile, kind of like the power of cards that were built on that NPM package that one guy in Nebraska maintained in the cartoon. Uh, and sometimes they can be a little deceiving, like what Moxie showed us with the NFT market. Even easy data can be difficult to manage. I mean, if Facebook struggles with it, don't feel bad if your company does too, really. Um, and, and often, often our data management tools are still going to lead us astray because even in simple cases like Excel, you know, the packages are just trying to be super helpful and guess our needs, which they really 
shouldn't do, but they do because that's what sells. Getting people to think differently, to see differently, to do things differently is hard. Like we saw in the beginning, we talked about digital transformation as uh, installing habits and practices, installing habits and practices to use technologies, um, to do things like increase connectedness, intelligence, and automation, to do things like to help your company achieve its quality and performance goals. It would be so easy, you know, when I'm when I'm working with with all these companies uh, on data management issues, it would be so easy if they would just invest in drawing out data lineage as a matter of habit. It would be so easy if they just treated their data management with the sanctity that food service treats their process, at least if you have a, a high rating. Um, it would be so easy if everybody mapped their package dependencies and then put it in, in risk management. And you know, it would be so easy if I, I can think of a hundred more things. There's, there's so many things that would make life so much easier. But like you see on the screen here, if you want to be a change agent because if everybody did things my way, it would work. And I would like to ask, have you ever met a person? Because that is not going to characterize your experience. Being a change agent is hard. Getting people to discover new ways of thinking and seeing and being and encouraging them to form new habits and giving them the, the time and the space to develop. It, it's costly. It, it requires planning in advance. It can be hard. But, you know, it, it, even just starting simple by, by looking at data through the lens of, of quality like you might do for ensuring high quality food service. Um, we know we have to help people understand how to internalize those future impacts. Like, you know, even if people aren't going to get sick or die as a result of data quality issues, let's treat it with the same level of, of rigor and, and sanctity. From the story about Moxie, we can see that getting people to see the truth in the promise of a, a new emerging technology can sometimes take Herculean effort, sometimes subversive efforts. Um, marketing works for a reason because it appeals to our sense of uncertainty and it helps us see possibilities where there may or may not actually be any. From the story about Azure Kochalu, we can see just how important dependencies are and uh, getting other people to see that, that mapping them and incorporating them into risk management um, is something that you should do. Just making that important to other people takes time and sometimes, unfortunately, catastrophes. Um, actually, catastrophes are pretty good at convincing people that they should do things a different way. I'm, I'm not saying that you should plan catastrophes, but they're usually very effective. And what I learned from Alan, the, the CEO of the Metaverse company, is that the quality of the story is what ultimately matters. The quality of the story is what ultimately matters. And we see that in improving data management. Um, we see that in articulating dependencies. So that's what I want to leave you with the main lesson here. If there's one thing that you focus on as a leader in this space throughout this next decade is learn ways to build context and build shared understanding. Learn ways to create good, simple, tangible, meaningful, and compelling stories around what you do because that's exactly what we're going to need to make quality and performance improvement real enough for people to be able to span the business side and the technology side to help you achieve your goals. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Red Zawil. And now we will open it up for questions. So just thank you for that journey through time. We have this phenomenal look at digital innovations and quality really through the lens of advances in so many different spaces in the industries. And I want to thank you for bringing that together so that we could better understand and, and our audience can perhaps see and hear themselves in the different examples that you gave. So I'd like to open it up to our attendees and see if we have questions tonight come in. And while we're waiting for them to queue, in addition to the reminders that you gave us at the end of your discussion for, for digital quality leaders in this day and age and looking forward to 2030, what are a couple other attributes or characteristics that you feel they need 
to either learn if it's not already in their toolkit or or really uh, enhance so that they they can fully understand and harness both the technology and and the value of data going forward in these spaces so number one absolutely is to build those skills in simple and and tangible and meaningful um, storytelling, right? Making those stories real. But there's a couple things that you can also work on, that you can also learn, that'll help you build those good stories. So for example, basic data literacy, super important. I can't tell you how many times I, I see people put charts and graphs together that are just not, they just don't hang together. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's a message that you want to communicate with your data, but the way that you present it just doesn't align with that message. So basic data literacy is, is super important. And we have a whole bunch of statisticians in ASQ and uh, the more recently data scientists that uh, there's a lot of resources in the technical communities to, to be able to, to learn those skills. Um, the other thing uh, that is, is super important is just process mapping. You know, this is something that as quality professionals, we learn how to do. We know how to do flow charts. We know how to do value streams, stream maps. You can use all those same tools and techniques to, to, to articulate, to draw out the characteristics of your data flows. Um, they apply just the same. Um, the challenge that, that we have to uh, shepherd people through is, I think, the fear of technology. You hear, you hear words that, um, relate to a software package or, you know, sound like the, the programmers or engineers use them. And what you really have to dig down is, well, what's the meaning of that? What does it actually do? Oh, so you have a JDA system. That's great. What kinds of data does it support? And when you get to the level where you're like, oh, it, it supports um, uh, materials and facilities and build materials and production schedules. Ah, okay, now I can map that to a concept that I understand. Uh, being able to do that process mapping and draw out Business analysis. These are these are you know tried and true old timey skills. Super important as we move forward. We just have to do a better organization in our. Uh, we have to do a, a better. Um, we have to do better in our organizations to bring together the business and the technical side because there's still a little bit of a siloing between them. Um, that's something that we got to work on as we're engineering our organization. Thank you, and that's a perfect segue into my next question. You spent so okay. much time really focused on the, the C-suite and helping companies scale and accelerate their business results. Could you just give us an example of really how you're harnessing these digital technologies, techniques, and the data to be able to help your clients move further faster? That is a really, really big question. Um, but what I can tell you is like, uh, here, here's, here's an example of something that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, we, we had some teams develop an adaptation of, of SIPOC, so supplier input process, output customer, an adaptation of SIPOC for, for um, uh, documenting and describing data flows. And so what we found, the, the acronym is, is AIADV. I've got some articles coming out on it in, let's see, it's October right now, coming out next month. Um, AIADV stands for Arrivals, Integration, Analysis, Delivery, and Value. So it's just a way of, of taking a look at the um, objects that arrive into your ecosystem, the tasks that manipulate the data, the tasks that create new information from the data, and then how you package it up to deliver to, to different people, different parties. And at the very end, it's, you know, when you, when you look at this report or when you look at this dashboard, what's the thought process you go through to drive value? And, and what you're able to do with that process is, is drive the lineage backwards to figure out which parts of that data flow are, like basically apply the Pareto principle, right? Which 20% of the pieces in this data flow are dominating 80% of us being able to, to meet our quality requirements. And it, it actually plays out pretty consistently that, that you're able to do this. So uh, we document the data flows. We, we, um, we use uh, the AIADV to document the data flows. Um, 
I'm starting to, you can tell it's getting late. Like I, my, my brain decided that, Hey, it's eight o'clock. Now is the time for, you know, the thinking to stop. Let me see if I can, I can get this, this thought out. Um, what you can then do when you've mapped those data flows and you've applied the Pareto principle to see where you should place quality controls. But you can also apply um, types of waste. So the, take the seven types of waste from lean management, and then there's two, I can't remember off the top of my head now what the extra two were, but uh, you apply those nine types of waste, you can actually draw out, you know, what in this data flow is pre preventing us, what's blocking us from stepwise improving quality. Uh, and there's, you know, since these systems have grown up like little Frankensteins, um, you know, it's, it, it's really interesting when you share with VPs and C-level execs how that organic process has led to waste and rework and duplication and, you know, especially with um, potential recession looming, uh, a lot of people are really interested in identifying those things so they can, you know, stop their subscriptions. It's a, uh, sometimes it can be like a million dollar a year benefit just to not use something you're not using. I completely understand and thank you. So Dr. Rad Zawil and all of our attendees, we want to thank you tonight as part of the ASQ Innovation Technical Community for attending. We hope that you really enjoyed and learned a lot from our digital quality leadership, a new look at change. Please do follow up with Dr. Rad Zawil on LinkedIn. Yep. And we have a discussion forum on my ASQ where you can ask her further questions and we'll post her deck for reference as well. So again, thanks to Dr. Radzeville. We welcome you to, if you are not a member of our my ASQ Innovation TC or ASQ to join ASQ as an individual member or ASQE as an organizational member, we welcome you on 1110 to our next upcoming webinar with Ms. Ciara Unger for A Business Case for Cultivating Purpose, and on 1201 with our phenomenal Mr. Dan Z hitting the eye spot, innovation through the lens of Aikigi. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your week, a safe weekend, and we look forward to you rejoining us on 1112. Good night, everybody, and thanks again. ASQ Innovation TC out for now. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, everybody. Good night.